Um, Our reading today is from Romans, chapter 15, verses 4 through 13. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, so that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together you may, with one voice, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the circumcised on behalf of the truth of God in order that he might confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written. Therefore, I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. And again, he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let the peoples praise him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse shall come, the one who rises to rule the Gentiles. In him the Gentiles shall hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite the children forward for the children's message this morning. Hello, everybody. You can have a seat. How are you today? A little tired still? Yeah. Blankets feel really good when it's cold outside. One of the things that we do in church every Sunday is we share the peace. We go around and give handshakes or peace signs or hugs. Do you you remember that part of the service? You kind of like that part of the service? You get to say hi to people. You get to see your friends. Some congregations take longer than others. I think we got a pretty good timing. You don't have to say hi to everybody, but you get a good chance to say hi to a lot of people. Share the peace of Jesus with them. Today is the candle of peace that we light for our Advent wreath. And that peace has a couple symbols in this world. Have you ever, have you noticed that I always wear a necklace? It's, it's called a pe- pectoral cross. And today I decided to wear two. And I've never worn two before. But the reason that I wore two is because my first one is a cross with what animal on the inside? A dove, which is a symbol of peace. Can I see it? A look at it. It's made out of, you called to pass it over. It's made out of olive wood. And it was a, a gift that I gave a group of colleagues. I kept one and I gave it to them so that we would always know that we were praying for each other and have peace in our lives. And there's another one that's a little less traditional that I wore today. Have you ever seen this before? Yes? Have you ever seen that before? You have one of these? It's almost a cross, right? We see the cross has the arms that go up and down and sideways. This has one that goes up and down, but the sideways one's bent a little bit, right? So I wear this as a cross, but it, its symbol, like the dove, is a peace sign. So that's what it is. If you can't see it, it's a peace sign. And this is a unique peace sign. So the peace sign was actually developed because people were killing each other or threatening to kill each other all the time. And so the line up and down is a D, like in, in the military and on boats, they have flags. If you're on one boat and you go to another boat, they didn't have, you couldn't talk to anybody, so they'd hold up flags and they'd make shapes, and it was the alphabet. And so the flag straight up like that is a D, and down like this is an N, so that's an N and a D, and it means nuclear disarmament. It means let's stop making weapons and things that are just meant to hurt and kill everybody, because that's the opposite of peace. Peace is about loving and taking care of each other. And so this is an interesting one because, Jack, what does it say on the back when you read those words? Peace bronze. So this used to be, the metal that this is made out of used to be in a nuclear bomb system. 
This was the part that you pushed the button and you sent a nuclear bomb to go kill millions of people. And they took it apart and they said, that's it, we want peace. We're going to get rid of this stuff. And that's why this exists. And it's what Jesus taught us, because Jesus said something that's really important. He said that we should take our swords and our weapons of destruction and beat them into plowshares. We should take those tools that are meant to hurt each other, and we should turn them into things that help us to grow and thrive in the world and love each other. And that's what we celebrate today when we light that candle. Advent is, is a peace candle today. Peace is a really good thing. We, we need it in our lives. And so every Sunday we come to church and we wish peace on each other's lives. When we say the peace of the Lord be with you or Jesus' peace be with you, that's what we mean. We hope that you have peace in your life. Yes? If we didn't have peace, this whole place would go down in horror. You get it. Let's pray. God, thank you for sending your son. Thank you for bringing peace into this world and into our lives. Help us to be people of peace, your disciples, who also beat our swords into plowshares. We ask for your guidance and your love and your help with this, Lord, knowing that it can only truly come from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good job, everybody. You can have a seat. And congregation, I invite you to rise for the gospel. Blessed be God, the source of all life, the one of salvation, the spirit of mercy. The Holy Gospel, according to St. Matthew, the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him, and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say for yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. With the shaft, he will burn with unquenchable fire. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Unlike many institutions, the church is not exclusive. Let me rephrase that. The church is not meant to be exclusive. Unlike a social club, potential new members in the church are not blackballed or tossed to the curb because somebody already part of the community doesn't like that person. The church is a very unique thing. We welcome all because Jesus welcomes all. And if you've ever been a part of a new member's class or joined a church, you got to experience that amazing feeling of welcome when you joined Standing up front, sharing brief statements of belief, welcomed with appreciative applause, new members get to that feeling of unconditional love when they are welcomed into a congregation. All of us remembering our baptisms together, we get to recognize that we are all sinners, forgiven by an all-inclusive and unconditionally loving God. In our gospel reading today, 
John the Baptist is faithfully doing his work of preparing the way for the Messiah. The promised Savior that the community was dreaming would come and relieve them from the sinful ways of the world. John's baptizing many people, all those that he expects are going to show up and join the movement. And then, to his great surprise, God also sends those that challenge John's preconceived notions of just who salvation is for. This movement that God has charged him with to be the forerunner of Jesus himself, this movement is larger than what John thinks. Even the Pharisees, even the Sadducees are being led by God into this new way of life. The very first pages of the gospel, in those pages, we are challenged to set aside our preconceived notions as well of just how big this Jesus Christ event is going to be for the world. It is indeed still bigger than what we think today. Like John the Baptist, we are all left wondering, well, who else then is God going to let in? It's here where I think John starts to understand, like the whole of the New Testament tries to help us to understand, that this ministry of God and the life of Jesus Christ is going to include so many more people than anybody has ever thought before. This is a movement begun in John's preparing the way that is going to reach to absolutely every corner of this world. John's baptism is a baptism of repentance, an installation into a new way of life that is going to mean change. Those who want to be a part of the Jesus movement we learn today are not going to remain the same. We are going to be challenged and move toward deeper understandings about God and each other. We're going to live lives very different than how we used to live our lives. We are going to grow and change as God redeems us. Repentance is just a fancy word for change. It means radical reorientation of life. In our baptism, it's God who picks us up on our path that we're on and turns us into the direction that leads towards God. We are reoriented in our lives to live the lives that God wants us to live. This is God changing us from who we used to be, living lives that led to sin and death, and restoring us to the good life that God wants for us, that leads to good relationships with God and all of God's good creation. Repentance means change. And for most of us, change is uncomfortable. It pushes us beyond what we thought were our limits. It stretches us to see further. It bends us away from our own will and into the will of God. And I think we get to see an epiphany moment for John the Baptist today. The fact that the Pharisees and Sadducees have shown up to be baptized by him, that makes John uncomfortable. He even goes so far as to say, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. John doesn't like that they're there. And we can tell, even without the stories in front of us, that there have been some bad relations between John and the Pharisees and Sadducees before. But what's so interesting is that in this opportunity for John to grow, to be stretched, to bend beyond his own will, we do see a man who recognizes his own limitations, his own sin. We witness a man who is starting to realize that God is going to include many people in his ministry that he might not even like. God is going to radically include so many people that are disliked, and that's because it's not a ministry of friends and like-minded people. No, it is a ministry of salvation for the world. And as Jesus said, he came for the sinners. He came for those that the world despises. He came for the people that many others definitely do not want included. Nowhere in the gospel today do we see John chase the Pharisees and Sadducees away. He may not have liked them. He may have had some pretty bad history with them. But he does not let that get in the way of the message that God has given him to proclaim. 
John is not a narcissist, and he's willing to let God expand God's ministry through him in ways that definitely push John beyond his perceived limitations of the kingdom of God. There's no reason for us to think that John did not baptize those with whom he disagreed. Even though John speaks harsh words to his enemies, it does not mean that he refuses to baptize them or to love them. Immediately after John has interactions with the Pharisees and Sadducees in the story today, his very first words that we hear are, I baptize you with the water for repentance. It's like he gets to tell them you need to change. Pharisees, Sadducees, you really need to change. May God let you finally see the light. The thing is, the honor of getting to say who's in and who's out is beyond any person. Just like you and me, John does not get to decide who gets in. It is God who baptizes. And I can almost feel the tension that John has with God and these requests that the Pharisees and Sadducees be baptized. However, what we see is a man who is willing to change, willing to bend to God's request, willing to let God's inclusive ministry challenge him. In John, we witness today a man who is repenting, changing before our very eyes, to submit to God's will even over and above his own. We see a man who indeed reminds us of Jesus Christ, to whom he points. The sinful world has corrupted us all and makes us think that we have the right to judge. Whether we do it intentionally or not, we all create in-groups cliques, clubs, teams, etc., and say that this group of people gets to be a part of it, and this group of people doesn't. In fear, we create many systems where we set it up so that we don't have to be around people that aren't like us, people that we don't like. But God has another plan for us, and that plan is the church especially in our denomination, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, we are clear that all are welcome. And we're like this. We stand with open arms to all those who God sends our way because when we interpret the Bible, when we look at the stories, we never, ever see Jesus blackball anybody. It is Jesus who has the right to judge, who doesn't even take it himself. We witness an inclusive ministry beyond what any of us are comfortable with. A ministry that never excludes, never excludes, not even the Judases and Herods in the story. In Jesus, we witness a ministry that stretches us to accept that Jesus loves and accepts all people. Even those at the base of his cross that are mocking him. He does not make an exception. There are too many things in this world that divide us. We have fallen victim. We have fallen victim to a divisive mentality. We are so often divided along human made lines. No matter how good of a person any of us thinks we are, even as good as John the Baptist, we don't like everybody in this world. And we do judge them harshly. But in And this is important here. We don't have to like each other to love each other. We don't have to think alike to love each other. We don't have to all share the same opinions to sit around the same table and break bread. This world will tell you different. Your friends may tell you different. And that's because the ways of sin and death in this world, they are doing their best to tear us apart. They don't want us acting with a uniform front to face them in their ways. Division is the tool of the devil. But the good news is that Jesus is the redeemer, the restorer, the reconciler, and through the Holy Spirit, he is gathering us together with many different ideas and perspectives, all with God-given gifts to make this world the place that God really wants it to be. And it is in the church alone where this can happen. 
from my perspective, it's the last place around. And correct me if I'm wrong on your way out, but it's the last place around that I can see in this world where people with different opinions and perspectives are still willing to get together at least for one hour a week. Can you name another place? Being addressed quite clearly in just the first few pages of the New Testament, we learn just how uncomfortably inclusive this new covenant with God is going to be. So many people, unlike us, are going to be included. God is going to send people that we might want blackballed. God's going to challenge each and every one of us to include others that we are convinced don't truly deserve God's unconditional love. Always have a caveat for that. We are called to let ourselves be uncomfortable as God does God's work of changing what needs to be changed in us and in this world. Because that's what this ministry of repentance is all about. God changing us. Not others, us. Like John the Baptist, we're probably going to see many people that we don't want included. But the gospel is quite clear to live and let live. To push beyond our judgmental and human-made boundaries. We too, like John the Baptist, are going to have to grow and our predetermined limitations that we put on the kingdom of God. In the gospel, radical inclusion is one of the first key principles that we learn about the kingdom of God. But that does not mean that the church has always done a good job at this. Sadly, the church has had many days under the sun acting like the immature boys in the little rascals, with no girls allowed signs posted on the entrance door. It's true that the church has not lived up to the kingdom of God that Jesus and John the Baptist hold up for us today. And yet God is active and always has been in healing us from our hurtful pasts. God's action in repentance is quite clear. God's action in changing us has always been the key to the success of the kingdom of God on earth. Historically, it took Peter's rooftop experience for many to finally see and realize that we are really supposed to include all people, that there is no excuse to exclude anybody. It's taken Paul's conversion story and his ministry to the Gentiles to help us see how expansive this ministry actually is, how important this gospel message is for everybody, how radically welcoming the ministry of Jesus Christ is supposed to be, Again, those that many were convinced shouldn't have been welcomed have been. And that includes you and me. Let's not forget that. The Gentiles who are eventually adopted into the story of salvation. This is true. If it were not for God's work of accepting all others that some don't want accepted, you and I would still be excluded. Remember, you and I are the Gentiles in the story that Jesus gets scolded for even talking to. We were not welcome. It wasn't until the ministry of St. Paul, until you and I were allowed to be Christians. We are those who many before of us, before us were perfectly convinced that we should be excluded too. Truth be told, you and I can probably right now think of some group of people in the church that many would still like to exclude. And so our work is to stand up and let the world be uncomfortable with who we worship with, who we include in our inner circles, who we proudly stand up for, who we worship with, but would definitely be excluded at another congregation. John proves that the ministry of God calls us as workers of the kingdom of God and part of this ministry is to let ourselves sometimes be uncomfortable. It's not about only being with like-minded people. It's not about spending time with only the people that I like. Instead, it's about sitting at a table and letting ourselves be challenged and uncomfortable sometimes. The ministry that Jesus is calling us, calling us to, is to be with people that are different from us in every way. The ministry that Jesus calls us to is one that welcomes all people that God sends our way. 
The ministry of Jesus is to love and accept even the least lovable and the most unacceptable that we can imagine. When Jesus Christ established the ways of the kingdom of God on earth in his ministry, he expected that his people, you and me, would follow him in welcoming all the sinners, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, or anybody that we and our society might not like for some reason. And it is our job as self-proclaimed followers to love them all just like Jesus did. Amen. Please join me in the hymn of the day. I invite you to rise as you are able. It's hymn 255. There is a voice in the wilderness. Together with the whole church, we profess our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with the prayers of the people. As we prepare for the fullness of Christ's presence, let us pray for a world that yearns for new hope. God, you renew the church in every age. We give thanks for hymn writers and theologians, inspire teachers, writers, and musicians to delight and instruct your people. God, in your mercy. You give us a vision of creation and harmony when hurting and destruction will be no more. Teach us to be stewards of the earth 
and companions of its creatures, restore to balance and wholeness what human greed has harmed. God, in your mercy. You defend the cause of all who are poor and oppressed. Raise up leaders who will govern with equity and serve the common good. Guide judges, lawmakers, and public officials to protect the rights of those who cannot advocate for themselves. God, in your mercy. You deliver those from suffering and fear. Come to the aid of those who are exploited or abused, especially children, elders, victims of human trafficking. Provide safety and help to our neighbors without shelter, refugees, and those fleeing violence. God, in your mercy. You urge your people to welcome one another as you have welcomed us. Nurture ministries of hospitality and care in this congregation and every congregation. We pray for people who are homebound, hospitalized, or separated from loved ones, especially Lori, Ron, Carol, Angela, Dan, Beth, Larry, Joe, Gerald, and those we name now in our hearts and on our lips. God, in your mercy, you embrace all who have died, trusting in your promises, and we give thanks for their faithful witness. Sustain us in hope until we are united with them in the joy of your eternal presence. God, in your mercy, God of our longing, you know our deepest needs. By your spirit, gather our prayers and join them with the prayers of all your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ to be with you always. You. Share a sign of peace with your neighbors. We continue with our offering.
The eternal God, you make the desert bloom and send springs of water to thirsty ground. Receive these simple gifts of bread, wine, and money, and make us messengers of your mercy and love for all in need of your healing and justice. We ask this through Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. You are indeed holy, almighty and merciful God. You are most holy and great is the majesty of your glory. You so loved the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who has faith in him may not perish but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. The night in which he was handed over, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Remembering, therefore, his salutary commands, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again, we give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants, in these your own gifts of bread and wine, so that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace and receiving the forgiveness of sin may be formed to live as your holy people and be given our inheritance with all your saints. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church now and forever. Amen. And because we are here to meet with Jesus, we join our words to those who taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. In Christ's presence, there is fullness of joy. Come to the banquet. I invite you to be seated. Our ushers will guide you forward for Holy Communion this morning. Will the communion assistants please meet me at the altar? Hymn number 479, We Come to the Hungry Feast.
Hymn number 632, O God, our help in ages past. together on our knees. Let us break bread together Please rise for the table blessing. How precious is your faithful love, O God. All people may take refuge in the shadow of your wings to feast on the abundance of your house and drink from the river of your delights. And so we thank you that in Jesus' bread of life you have come to us and at this table you have fed us. Now send us into the world in peace, we who have reached out our hands to receive this sacrament. We who have sung your praises, grant us strength, courage, and hope through your spirit of grace to love and serve you with gladness. Amen. Faithful God, in this meal you have remembered your mercy, bringing heaven to earth in the body and blood of Christ. As we wait for the day when all your promises will be fulfilled, sustain us and strengthen us by this holy ministry. Guide us toward your promised future coming to birth in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you.
the Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Amen. Amen. Please join me in our sending him uh, 254, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Go in peace. Christ is near. Thanks be to God.